city of Munich. Today, we are connecting the world at the Optica Industry Tutorial. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jose Pozo. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Optica, and I have the pleasure and honor to introduce our corporate member, Menlo Systems. Today, we are addressing the need for ultra stable laser systems for, for ultra precise metrology applications as well as quantum applications. What we are going to do in the next hour is to review some of the key applications in quantum technologies that are driven by ultra stable laser systems. This is not a marketing event, this is a tutorial for all of you to learn how to address the next generation quantum applications. And for that, I have the honor and pleasure to travel to Bavaria, to travel to Munich and meet my friend, Dr. Sandra De Vega. Sandra, thank you very much for being with us this beautiful afternoon. The floor and the attention of the Optica members looking forward to working with you is yours. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. So. I would like to share my presentation very quickly. And now I'm a bit. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so I guess you can see my slides. And um, okay, let me put it over here. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, I'm very glad to be here. So thank you very much for this invitation to give this industry tutorial and to, yeah, let us uh, present about commercially available solutions for ultra stable lasers. And uh, of course, this is um, team, <laughs> a team effort. So I would like to present you also uh, Maurice Lessing and Jason Reeves, my colleagues, which uh, will be working in the background in the Q&A. So please, if you have any questions anytime, uh, just uh, use this tool and they will be very glad to, to answer all your questions and they are very knowledgeable. So uh, Maurice is the team leader of the R&D department for ultra stable lasers and uh, Jason is the um, US is a senior sales engineer and he has been working with these systems also for, for very long. And uh, of course, I will be your speaker today and let me put this laser pointer out. So yeah, without further ado, let me introduce uh, a little bit the company. So, yeah, as Jose was saying, uh, Menlo System, Menlo Systems is located at the very south of, of Germany in a very beautiful city, which is called Munich, and is very close to the Alps, as you can see here, these mountains that you see in the background. So very welcome <laughs> to see you around and uh, if you visit it. And Although our main manufacturing facility and our headquarters are located in, in Germany, we have also subsidiaries uh, around the world. So more specifically in the US, in China, and in Japan. And apart from this, we also have some offices in Berlin and in Bordeaux in France. So Menlo Systems was founded in 2001 as a spin-off of the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. And the founders were uh, Michael May, Ronald Holzfatz, uh, Professor Theodor Hench, and also Alex Cable. And the mission of the company was to spread the frequency comp technology around the world. And this was actually a huge revolution, such a revolution that in 2005, Professor Theodor Hench won the Nobel Prize because of this technology, along with Professor John Hall and Roy Glover. So you can see the importance of, of this type of technology. And although everything started with uh, frequency comms, our portfolio has expanded over, over the years. So, okay, we have here the frequency comms, but of course we have ultra stable lasers, which are the topic of this industry tutorial. Uh, we also have a product line based on terahertz solutions, also femtosecond lasers, which are the core of the technology, quantum laser systems, which I will speak about them. Uh, I will speak about uh, very briefly towards the end of the presentation and uh, solutions for, for space. Let me point out that if you go in the recordings of these uh, Optica industry tutorials, you will probably find uh, one which is related to quantum laser systems, also frequency comms, and if I remember correctly, also for space solutions. So I welcome you to go back to the <laughs> to these to these recordings. Good, but let's jump into the topic. So, if we want to talk about 
ultra-stable laces, the first thing that we need to do is to define what we mean by ultra-stable laces. So in this case, we are going to define it as a single frequency laser with a narrow optical emission spectrum whose optical frequency of the output is made particularly stable. So basically, one frequency, it, is, it has to be very narrow and very stable. So as the, yeah, stable specifically is something uh, that we also need to define, I would like to introduce you to two concepts. One is the concept of accuracy and the other is the concept of stability because this will be very important for, for this type of systems and for the applications in general. So when we talk about accuracy, what we mean is the agreement of the mean to the, um, the mean of the measuring, uh, measurement set with the, with the target, so to say. While stability is the agreement of the full set. So I think with these pictures, we, we, we see it a bit better. So in this case, not the dots are all very much together. So this measurement would be uh, very stable, but as you see, it's not accurate no? because it's out of the target. In this case, the set does not really agree and also it doesn't match the target. No? So this is not stable and it's not accurate. In this case, so the, the points are very spread out, but the mean really hits the target. So this is something that is accurate. And of course, if you have both together, then you have a then you would have a system or a measure, a measurement that is both accurate and precise. And in order to quantify stability, I would like to introduce you to the concept of Alan variance. So this, um, for this, we need to take into account fractional frequencies, which are basically like this. No, so it's like um, a contiguous uh, measurement of contiguous to contiguous frequencies. And when you take you know, the statistical variance of this um, time domain measurement, what you get is uh, the, area, the Allen variance. And when you take the square root of it, then you get the Allen, the Allen deviation, which is usually the, the, um, uh, the figure of merit. And more specifically, when it is defined at one second, because we care about uh, short-term stability, so that's why we also define this at, uh, at one second. Good, so now we have defined you know, how to calculate the stability, we have a figure of merit, now uh, we need to build an uh, ultra-stable laser. And uh, there are three main basic elements for active stabilization of a laser. The first one is a stabilized optical resonator. And with stabilized, I mean that you have to take care of thermal effects, acoustic effects, vibrations, and so on and so forth. You also need a frequency tunable laser, CW laser, and some electronics or electronic controller that needs to translate these detected frequencies deviations no, into some correction signal. So basically, you need some feedback electronics in general. So the setup. Uh, very schematically would look like this. No? You have your CW laser, your resonator, a fabric perocavity, and some feedback electronics. I'd like to then now start with CW laser and the cavity. So in general, the CW laser is, um, in our case, for instance, is something that we integrate from some other providers. And uh, we've, yeah, we've chose We've done it with many different types of CW lasers, like diode lasers, fiber lasers, vexels. And uh, as I said, um, we've worked with so many different uh, manufacturers like Moglabs, NKT Photonics, Toptica, Rio lasers, and many others. Um, I think when choosing uh, one of these CW lasers, when, what we need to take into account is that um, it goes with fast actuators. But apart from this, yeah, you can pick up almost anything almost, any, almost any, any type of CW laser. Okay, but to, to define the cavity, I would like to uh, refresh some of the con concepts from um, maybe your early time physics courses. So of course, this is a very exaggerated picture of the, of the wavelength, but it's, um, yeah, it's to make it a bit more visual. So let me call the wavelength lambda and the length of the cavity L. 
So if you remember the uh, profile of the transmission, no, that of the light that let's let's say fits inside the cavity looks like this, no. So the resonant condition goes uh, the resonant condition of the frequency, no, that fits inside inside the cavity is a n, which is an integral number times the free spectral range, which is defined by the speed of light over twice the length of the cavity. And this is a very interesting relationship because if you remember, no, we were talking about um, uh, fractional fractional frequencies before. So we have a way of relating uh, the difference in length of the cavity with differences in frequency. And this will be important all along the presentation, as you will see. Um, another characteristic of the cavity is the finesse that we define as the free spectral range over the full width of half maximum. So usually the narrow the narrower these features are, the higher the finesse is. And um, I want to give you no, a picture of how we qualify, uh, or in general, how people qualify the finesse. And we usually do this by means of measuring the cavity ring downtime. So what we do is we shine the laser inside the cavity, right? And uh, with a constant intensity, and at some point, boom, we, we stop it. So when the intensity drops by uh, 1 over E, the time is the same as this cavity ring down time. And this uh, specific time, this cavity ring down time, is related to the full width of half maximum. So by measuring this uh, time, then this is, this is how we can qualify the finesse. And let me point out that um, a time like this, like 40 microseconds, which it's equivalent to this finesse on the order of uh, 300,000 finesse is pretty remarkable. But because if you take into account that this cavity is on, or the order, on the order of uh, centimeters, like uh, in our case, for instance, 12 centimeters, the light travels uh, this distance in like less than one nanosecond. So this implies no, that your photon is more than three orders of magnitude trapped in time inside the cavity, which is pretty remarkable. But um, yeah, so going back to this, uh, to this picture, as I was saying, the stability will be related, not somehow to the length. And you may tend to think that if the, the, if the cavity is, uh, is very long, this will be very small and this is very nice because then the, <laughs> the system will be very stable, right? Well, life is many times complicated and there are so many effects that uh, affect the performance. So let's see, uh, let's have a look at them one by one. So the first effect that you have to take into account is the changes in the refractive index. And these usually come because of differences in, in pressure. So a way to solve it would be by putting your, your resonator inside a vacuum system and have it in, in high vacuum. Another effect is aging. So the glass decrystallizes and then the cavity shrinks. So you need to choose a material that has this uh, drift minimized. Another effect is uh, vibrational, vibrational sensitivity. So to solve that, you can have a mounting which is uh, insensitive against vibration. And also you can have some sort of active vibration isolation, like a platform or, or something like that. Uh, another effect is the acoustic acoustic noise. And for that, what you can get is an enclosure, acoustic isolation enclosure, so that yeah, you avoid this type of this type of effect. And the last but but not least is the you have the thermal thermal effects both at the macro scale and at the micro scale in terms of Brownian motion. And we will touch upon this macro uh, um, thermal effect a bit later. You will see it a bit later on, so I won't discuss much. But we can say that the, there are plenty of solutions. So you can choose a material with zero expansion coefficient. You can get some thermal shielding, uh, a temperature stabilization system, or yeah, decrease the mechanical loss of the components. Okay, so we have defined the CW laser. We have also our cavity completely stabilized and isolated against, <laughs> against all the effects that we've seen. We need to know, we need to 
do now this uh, feedback electronics. But before we enter into the feedback electronics, I would like you to please have a look at a short survey that will appear in on the screen. And uh, yeah, we give you like 30 seconds. So please, if you have a look and answer, it will be very nice. Okay. Okay. So now I have in front of me the the results. So thank you all for participating and submitting your responses. I can see that many people is unsure, <laughs> uh, but the next will be uh, ten to the minus sixteen in terms of uh, the short term stability that people would need, and then. Uh, answering the question of what is most important for your application, I see that the last one, the turnkey solution automation, is something that is uh, pretty popular, but uh, more or less are all um, very balanced. But yeah, interesting. Thanks a lot. I will close it uh, and then let's continue. Good. So uh, we were here at the definition of the feedback electronics. For this, um, you have plenty of options. Um, for instance, you can get a vapor absorption cell, like for instance, iodine, iodine cell, which is pretty popular. You can also do fringe locking, which uses the slope on either side of the transmission peak to convert its uh, frequency fluctuations of the laser into amplitude fluctuations. And then these are detected with a photodiode. Um, but this suffers of um, quite a few disadvantages. So that's why some people have uh, thought of some other methods. Another method which is pretty similar to the one that we use is the Hench um, uh, culotte, which, um, yeah, as I said, is pretty similar to the one that I'm going to explain a bit later, but as it needs to have an intracavity linear polarizer, uh, this is not the one that we will choose. The one that we choose is the pound driver hole technique, uh, pound driver hole method, which is very, very popular and offers one of the best performances uh, out there. Okay, so our feedback electronics is actually boundary hole electronics, which look like this. Boom. This is just to scare you. Um, no, there are so many things going on. So I would like to go a few steps back and then explain uh, where all this comes from. Okay, so let's get back to this picture now of the CW laser with the cavity and also to the transmission course, as I, as I, was, as I was saying. So you remember for the feedback, one second, no, you need to detect some frequency deviations, no? So one option that you may think is that what you can do is to measure the intensity uh, in transmission, right? And then feedback this, um, um, this detected signal into the laser. The problem that comes is that when you change the frequency, you don't know if you are going up and down in this curve when you move the frequency, or if the CW laser on its own um, is suffering some frequency, some, some intensity fluctuations. So um, yeah, we need to think of some other solution. So another option would be that, okay, we forget about transmission and we think of reflection and we measure the intensity in reflection and hold it to zero. So we, we hold it here. But of course, um, yeah, as I said before, Life is many times <laughs> problematic, so here we have a second problem. And the problem is that this is symmetric about the resonance. So we don't know if we need to decrease um, the frequency to bring it back to resonance or we need to 
um, if we need to increase it or we need to decrease it. So we need to find something else. So, okay, a parabola is symmetric, but the derivative of a parabola, which is a straight line, is not. So, yeah, let's measure the derivative of the intensity in reflection and then hold it to zero. And with this, this signal, we can feed it back to the laser. And tachan, this is basically the, the, the background of the pound driver hole method. And uh, more specifically, what we do is we measure the relative phase between the promptly reflected beam and the leakage beam, because this, is, this strongly depends on the frequency of the CW laser. Good. So what you have or what you um, would need to build is something, something like this. No? The EOM will be here for the um, phase modulating the light, but it can be also a pocket cell. So there are a couple, um, a couple of options, but this is the one that we, that we usually use. So the error signal is generated by phase modulating uh, the laser light with an electroptic modulator in our case, and then down mixing it, down mixing the photodiode signal, which is um, which comes from the reflected light from the cavity. So we down mix it with the uh, modulation frequency to DC, and then uh, the frequency of the CW laser is. Um, stabilized via a fast feedback to the current and a slow feedback to the temperature uh, or piezo actuator of the of the CW laser. It depends a bit on the laser source, but one, one of the two. And as we are talking about modulation, this implies side spans. So for narrow cavity resonances, like um, lasers with line widths, which are like a few kilohertz, these modulation side bands <laughs> are reflected. Uh, when the carrier is resonant with the, with the cavity. So what you see is actually two heterodynes uh, bit signals with these reflected side bands. And the characteristic PDH signal, it will be visible after the, mod the modulation. And it will look uh, like this. No? This is a normalized error signal. And then you will see these features. And uh, let me point out that usually the narrower these features are, the easier to handle and to detect this signal is. And uh, this, how narrow these are is something that is directly related to the finesse. So usually the higher the finesse, in general, the better resolution no, for this error signal you will have. But let me point out that if you have a complete system, which gives you already the ultra-stable uh, the ultra -stable light, the ultra-stable laser, the finesse is not a relevant, relevant parameter because this is something that is optimized internally. If you just get the cavity, yes, but for a full system, uh, this is not something that will be very relevant. Okay, so then we have our scheme to build a ultra -stable, an ultra-stable CIA laser. So imagine that you want to do it on your own. Good, so in the best case, probably it takes you around two years um, and the uh, highly chances that this is uh, full-time working, working in the system. It might be not very elegant. Uh, the performance is not warranty because remember, this is something key no? for the qualification. You require at least two similar systems. It can use lots of space. Um, yeah, you are basically building something that is commercially available. And in the long run, it can be probably more expensive than buying one. So on the other hand, you can get a commercially available solution like, for instance, our optical reference systems, the ORS. And this is a um, full CW ultra-stable laser with subhertz line width, which is on a 19-inch rack. So it doesn't use um, space in your optical table. It uh, offers a very nice fractional stability. And uh, yeah, I, I put here 160, which is uh, this standard one, but it can be as small as, as um, I think it's 40 centimeters or so. And the components will be a cavity, which goes inside a vacuum system. And then uh, this will be installed here at the, at the bottom. And as you can see, we could also uh, integrate the, uh, all the electronics for the PDH stabilization, also the controllers for the ion getter pump and uh, the oscilloscope and so on and so forth. So, okay, let's go. Um, component by component, and then I present you how our systems look. So the first thing to, that I would like to introduce you are our cavities, which are 
made out of ultra low expansion glass by Kornick. We have two designs, one which is cylindric, 12 centimeters long, designed by PTB, and the cubic, which is five centimeters, and it was designed by the, by the NPL. And the, let's say the magic <laughs> of this material is that they have near zero expansion characteristics. So if we go to the Kornick webpage and have a look at the, at the coefficient of thermal expansion, you will see that uh, at room temperature in this block here, the coefficient, uh, this CTE, the coefficient of thermal expansion, is almost a straight line. So this implies that if you work at this critical temperature, the zero crossing temperature, the coefficient of thermal expansion is close to zero. So this implies that the, uh, the cavity doesn't change in length, which this is a very powerful, uh, very powerful thing for the, for the material. And if you remember, no, the changes in length are related to changes in frequency. So in, in our facility here, we qualify this uh, zero crossing temperature by measuring uh, the difference in frequency, no? the temp how the frequency changes uh, with the temperature. And as we have a parabola, we can always fit it and then realize or, or calculate uh, this zero crossing temperature. So this is usually something that uh, we do very often for the qualification of our systems. And uh, once you have your cavity, you, like, you would like to also contact mirrors. And we have three types, and I will introduce them uh, from worse stability to better stability. But let me, let me point out that although I said worse is actually pretty nice stability, you will see a bit later. But yeah, this is just to differentiate it. So the first type would be with uh, ultra low expansion glass sub substrate, ULE substrate, and some ion beam spattering, uh, spattered coating. Mm, the next, in terms of performance, will be to um, substitute the substrate and then have a few silica substrate. And then we add compensation rings just to bring this zero crossing temperature to, to room temperature. And the last option, which offers the very best performance will be to uh, remove this IBS coating and then have crystalline coatings. And these are the, let's say, top notch. Good, so now we take the cavity with our mirrors and then we need to put them inside the, inside the vacuum system. And uh, these are actually commercially available. So you can go to our webpage and you will see uh, all the different possibilities that we have here. But yeah, mostly uh, these are the vacuum system with the pelter elements, the ion get the pump, and so on. So yeah, it comes with a couple of, of, of add-ons. And we have two options, no, depending on the type of cavity. And I'm very uh, glad to present that very recently we started a collaboration with Thorlabs. So now we also uh, have available in our portfolio this uh, cavity with crystalline mirrors, and you can get yeah, finesses on the order of 300,000, which is, which is pretty high. So yeah, very nice to present this. And uh, you have, okay, now you have your cavity. The next step will be to populate everything with optics and electronics. So what we do at Menlo is that we have uh, in-coupling and out-coupling platforms. And this one will have the optics to couple the laser light inside the cavity and also some electronics like the EOM for the PDH and, and these type of things. And we, uh, when you put everything together, what you have is a full system. And uh, I would like to present you what I like to call the ORS family, which is composed of these uh, three systems, the, the ORS, the ORS Compact and the ORS Mini, which have, uh, as you can see here, no? these are the cavities that we use inside of them. So depending on the type of application that you uh, that you will choose, your requirements and so on, we will advise you on having one or the other because all of them have different advantages. So not uh, not always is uh, everything a matter of of how stable the system is. It's sometimes it's a matter of the footprint and or the wavelength or things like that. So yeah, in principle uh, we can cover almost any option when you think about wavelengths in between 500. Uh, up to um, 1,600 nanometers. 
Perfect. So just to give you some, um, some data on how these systems perform, they are all self-hertz. This one, uh, if you put it on an AVI platform, it also reaches self-hertz self language. And um, I would like to show you how the um, stability looks. So as you can see, for each of the different mirrors, uh, you will get a different stability. And as I was commenting before, this few silica with crystalline mirrors is the one that gives the best performance. But still, this ULE plus IBS uh, <laughs> mirrors are also performing very nicely. No? So you can see that um, we can go beyond um, uh, yeah, beyond 7 times 10 to the minus 16 in terms of stability no? at the VAT modified alert deviation at, at one second. Nice. And then uh, we also qualify the phase noise or the single sideband side phase noise, um, which is measured in our case by beating the, the, the ORS, yeah, 1542 or the wavelength that you, uh, that you are interested in, against our uh, ultra low noise comb in, the, in our facility. And this comb is also in turn referenced to another to another optical reference. So the bit is low pass filter and then is fed to a, to a phase noise analyzer. So this is how it looks. And let me point out that this measured phase noise gives an upper limit for the performance of the ORS. So beyond this, no. uh, so, yeah, so yeah, this can be even, even better. Okay, so now the question would be how um, or for what type of applications do we use uh, ultra-stable lasers. So there are plenty of applications, but uh, the three most popular would be these three. Oh, let me take an ah here, the laser pointer. So the interrogation of clock transitions, the quantum laser systems, and the ultra-low noise microwaves. Let's go one by one. Interrogation of clocks. Um, so yeah, this is just um, an example of um, a, um, energy level diagram of different species, strontium, meterbium, um, mercury. And as you can see here are the clock uh, transitions. So one thing that you realize immediately is that these are very, very narrow. And this, uh, this happens because these uh, transitions are forbidden. So that's why they are very narrow and very difficult to, to address. So that's why you need a uh, uh, subhertz language system. And um, so, yeah, if this can be done in uh, for, for, let's say, uh, optical clocks, but it can also be for quantum computers or, yeah, in uh, any type of coal atoms experiment no? where you need to access these transitions. Good. So the next example, uh, the next application would be for quantum laser systems. And uh, to introduce this, I would like to introduce you also to the concept of frequency comb. But uh, I don't want to that you get lost, uh, but because this is about ultra stable lasers, but I think it's important to introduce this concept. So in contrast to ultra stable CW lasers, a frequency comb is actually a pulse laser. So in the time domain, you have this sort of a structure, no? it's a, a pulse train. And when you Fourier transform this, uh, uh, these pulses in the, in the frequency domain, what you get is this type of comb structure. And uh, the two degrees of freedom that you have in this, uh, in this uh, type of laser are these, these two. One is the repetition, uh, repetition rate, the repetition frequency, which is you know, the difference in frequency between two contiguous modes and also the offset frequency, which is uh, which you can think about it as where the frequency comb is born. This repetition rate is usually easy to detect and to stabilize, but the one that is very tricky is this one. Uh, and we do, uh, and we stabilize it, detect it and stabilize it in, in Menlo by means of a F2 to F interferometer, where we take this, um, this frequency, for instance, no, in the red part of the spectrum, we frequency doublet, and then we beat it with 
the double of this frequency. So yeah, by simple mathematics, you can see that uh, we can retrieve the, um, the offset frequency. And then the master equation of the frequency comb is also uh, pretty simple. No, every uh, each of these optical modes is just an integral number times the repetition frequency plus the uh, offset frequency. So this makes the frequency comb to to act as an optical ruler. And in our case, not only as an optical ruler, but also as an optical synthesizer. So something that can really um, uh, transfer the stability of, of the laser uh, that is your reference. Good. So this is a very uh, important and key concept because when you stabilize your frequency comb to an optical reference, then the purity of, uh, of the ORS of your ultra stable laser will be transferred to all the optical, all, all the modes in the frequency comb. So if you lock all your CW lasers that you need to address the transitions of your atoms, if you lock them to the, to the frequency comb, they will all get stabilized and they will follow what your reference, what your reference does. So then what you have is a system, no, that is, uh, ready to, to be integrated with your physics package. So basically with, with the experiment, the, the real uh, trap with your atoms. So yeah, this is something that we um, manufacture here at Menlo. So this is the FC1500 quantum. So it, um, yeah, this is basically three quarters of a cold atom experiment because we offer all together an optical reference, one of these ultra stable lasers, the frequency comb, and all the CW lasers that you will need for your experiment. And we usually divide it in three racks. This one is already familiar to you, so not much to say. And in this one is where all the optics uh, will lie. So basically these different drawers um, correspond to the different CW lasers and also to the, to the frequency comb. And then the last rack here, the one to, to the left, will have all the electronics. We don't mix them because the yeah, electronics can get warm and uh, uh, yeah, it, they, are, they have some vibrations. So that's why we separate optics and electronics. But this one uh, has everything that you need so that the system is totally turnkey. So as you can see here, it has the computer, the drivers uh, for the amplifiers and for the comb and the CRA lasers. Uh, everything to control the repetition rate and the offset frequency and um, sealer, ethernet switch, basically everything so that <laughs> you just need to see it and then, and then, and then use it. Awesome. So uh, the last application that I would like to mention is the synthesis of ultra low noise microwaves. Uh, this is uh, in general similar to the concept that we have before, because, okay, we have here uh, the ultra stable laser. We also have here our most compact frequency comb, the smart comb. The difference is that, uh, so once we stabilize the optical, optical frequency comb to the, to the ultra stable laser, what we have also inside is an interleaver that acts as a fiber based pulse rate multiplier. So we now mix frequencies until we have very, very stable microwaves and i would like you to give uh, i would like to give you some some data so that you can compare so in this graph this phase noise compares uh, two available commercially available masers out there with our uh, ultra stable microwave generator our uh, ultra stable microwave system and as you can see there is there are some orders of magnitude magnitude in which this phase noise is better to this commercially available systems. Okay, um, I'm close to the end of my presentation because uh, the next will be to show you uh, a showcase of the of the ultra stable laser. And uh, because I, uh, before I switch on <laughs> the video, I would like to thank you so much for listening. Don't <laughs> stay tuned because the video will play right now. And just a small dis disclaimer towards the end of the video, uh, what I mean is that what it demonstrates is that the frequency comp follows very nicely the, um, the line width of the, um, of the stability of the ultra stable laser. 
Um, yeah, so with this, I would like to play the video. So just give me a second. So hello, we are now in the ORS laboratory here at Menlo, and I want to show you how the systems look in real life. So what you have here, it's an um, ultra-stable laser, what we call uh, ORS, which is based on an ECDL laser. And um, so this one in particular has a 12.1 centimeter cylindrical cavity, which is also 60 uh, millimeters in diameter. And this goes in the vacuum chamber that we will show in just a second. But just to break down uh, a bit each of the part, parts of the, of the ORS, so here what you see is an oscilloscope, which is used for monitoring, also for the error signal of the, of the PDH log. Uh, what you see here is um, the drawer, which has the ECDL laser. So we can basically log to a cavity any laser in between 500 nanometers and 2,000 nanometers. Um, but yeah, if it is in the C band or around 1060 nanometers, uh, what we have instead of an ECDL laser is a butterfly diode based on a Rio Planex. So you wouldn't see this part here, so we will show it in, in a second, uh, at one for 1542. So the next thing that you see here is the uh, controller of the ion getter pump. And also there is uh, a way of connecting an Ethernet cable so that you can also work um, remotely or connect it to some other device. And uh, a port for a camera basically to monitor the DM mode. Apart from this, just below, we have the universal synchro platform, which is, uh, as I said, a universal uh, locking electronics platform that we use in most of our, in most of our device. And the, just underneath, uh, what you see here is where the vacuum chamber and the cavity is. So this box is the acoustic isolation and this is the anti-vibration isolation platform. And what you see here is a um, uh, special setup because this is for a dual input um, in-coupling platform. But in general, if you work with one, uh, one wavelength, it will look a bit different. But here you can see no, all the optics. And then what you will see uh, at the back is the vacuum chamber with the ion getter pump that is just over there. And then inside goes the ULE, ULE cavity. So what you see here is um, our ORS at uh, 1542 nanometers. So this is based on a um, um, diode laser, a uh, Rio Planex usually. And this is the size that we, um, at which we manufacture those that have this type, of, uh, this type of laser. So it's a bit, the footprint is a bit smaller than the one that you just saw. And uh, yeah, but the configuration is uh, basically uh, basically the same. So what we are going to do now is to connect the output of this ultra stable laser via a fiber, and we are going to connect it to a optical frequency comb. And what we want to see is this uh, the CW bit, so that you can really see how the purity of this laser is transferred, and then also test that the line width of the laser is one hertz. So um, what you see here is uh, our most compact frequency comb. And uh, just uh, a, br a brief introduction to it. So in its core, a frequency comb is a femtosecond laser, which has fully stabilized the repetition rate, which in this case is 100 megahertz. And also it has fully stabilized the carrier envelope of the frequency, the CO. And uh, what we want to show here is how the purity of the ultra stable laser that you just saw can be transferred to the to the frequency comb and then the modes of this of this laser will uh, shrink up to one hertz which is the line width of the ultra stable laser so for that we have already connected um, our our ultra stable laser the ORS at uh, 1542 but for now, it is still, this uh, device still is free running, so we haven't changed the login target. What you see here is a spectrum analyzer, and basically this signal is uh, the free running, the free running bit. So this, what you see here is uh, directly related to the language of the comb modes. And 
So uh, in this screen, what we have is the center at uh, 30 megahertz and a span of one megahertz. So this implies that the um, free running smart com has a language for the modes of around 100 kilohertz. But if instead of um, having this uh, free running device, we lock it to the ultra stable laser, you will see how it changes. So we do it in a second. And then you see that this has shrink a lot. And of course, uh, now you cannot see, but if we change the span to 10 hertz, and then very quickly the bandwidth, you will very nicely see how these uh, modes have become one hertz. And also you can see that the ultra stable laser has the same language. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and I apologize for the small interference at the at the beginning of the video. I hope you, you enjoyed. So yeah, thank you very much again for your attention. And now we have some time for questions. So please go ahead if you have any. Otherwise, I can also read some of them here in the Q&A. Maybe I can stop this and then we can discuss. So uh, Meng Ding has asked, have you measured Alan deviation over uh, 10,000 seconds? Um, and here I can, I can read some of the some of the answers. So yeah, on longer time scales, the cavity exhibits a linear shrinking drift of the ULE glass. So this drift is typically of the order of uh, 150 millihertz per second. So this will lead to a drift of one kilohertz to 10 kilohertz at uh, 10,000 seconds. Osama Terra, ah, nice to see you. Hi. <laughs> um, He's asking, uh, what is the maximum laser length that we can start with the PDH locking? Um, so I've seen a large range of PDH locking, and it depends greatly on the experimental setup. The cavity, the EOM for the sidebands, and the laser all have influence on what the length uh, can handle. Um, for example, um, yeah, one example that Jason gives is that um, he used a cavity with a few thousand seconds, uh, a few thousand thousands finesse to lock the titanium sapphire laser down to less than 100 kilohertz. Um, but yeah, we can find some other exact numbers if you are interested in, please uh, just try to ask. Another interesting question is, um, is this one, what is the best self-stabilized lock mechanism me mechanism, and control loops uh, yeah, out there? Mm, so yeah, in our case, we use very fast PID loop filters and uh, very fast actuate, that actuators to achieve the very best performance. Um, another question that I, I can share with the rest would be what second harmonic generation module you use in the system? And um, there are a couple of options, but I think the most popular is these PPLN materials. Um, so, but yeah, if you have something something else in mind, uh, I, my colleague has already <laughs> sent you his, his email, he can answer and he can give you. Um, more advice. Oh, something is telling very nice talk. Thanks. <laughs> That's always nice to hear. Um, and then ah, another another question that uh, I think can be interesting for everyone. How does the phase stability? 
how does the phase stability of your 1542 nanometers real reference is transferred throughout the comb? Is there any expected degradation of the phase stability? Does this scale with the comb number away from the reference frequency? And uh, so the answer would be more like, mm, so, well, you, you saw in the video, no? the frequency stability can be uh, perfectly transferred throughout the whole comb. So the comb has two uh, actuators inside, um, and this is what allows no, to this spectral purity transfer. So, yeah, actually, there is, as, as, as I said at the beginning, there are uh, more industry tutorials that we did in the past, and this is something that we explain in one of them. So I welcome you to, to have a look. And this is something, uh, a question that I've been asked uh, many times. So uh, Meng Ding is asking if we need to realign the input coupling system when uh, when transporting the laser. And this is actually something that we don't need to do. Uh, there is a locking mechanism uh, that basically enables this this, this transport. So yeah, this is not something that you, you would need to do, no need of realignment. And uh, yeah, I think those were the questions uh, that I've seen. If you have any other, please feel free to ask either in the Q&A or, or just unmute yourself. Hey, Sandra, I just wanted to mention that we've been promoting your new white paper that just got posted. So oh, as we wait for nice. questions, maybe mm -hmm. you want to just give a little overview of that? Um, sure. Um, yeah, otherwise, so basically we have a new um, white paper that I welcome you to, to have a look. And uh, yeah, this has been posted in the chat and also uh, will be shared afterwards. Um, and I, yeah. I can see over here that all, all of these questions, even if you have any uh, remaining, we can always answer you via via email. And the rest of the questions that we don't answer now, we uh, we will also contact you, and then you will get a, an answer an answer for sure. Mm. Um, so I think I, I see now one <laughs> maybe final question. Uh, I, I can read it and then we can see if there are more questions. Otherwise, we can also um, yeah, wrap, it, wrap it up now and then, um, and then just stay in touch via email. So another question was, um, with expected power com being on the order of nanowatts, does this limit your dynamic range in sensing uh, uh, the frequency difference if used as a stable reference? And uh, ah, my colleagues have already replied. Sometimes I don't see. <laughs> um, we have means to amplify and broaden the COM spectrum to sufficient power levels for for wavelength. So, joint principle, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be a limit. 
yeah, it's, it depends on, on system to system and also, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the power is something that uh, in some cases we can also add an amplifier if needed. It depends on the on, on your requirements, of course. Um, okay. So if I don't see more questions, um, I think we can probably finish here. I'd like to thank you all uh, for coming and for tuning today. And I see that Jose appeared, so muchas gracias. <laughs> Sandra, thank you very much for a great tutorial. It is great that you use this time to provide knowledge to our industry, and that's what we value Menlo Systems so, so much. We're going to see a lot more from you at Laser Munich, where you will be part of the world of quantum. And I would like to remind everyone, please have a look. Have a look at the industry events that we have in our website, Optica Industry. And for those of you who are attending Laser Munich, by the way, remember we have a industry training courses that include courses all the way from designing your own laser, choosing your own laser, all the way to technologies for laser welding as well as technologies for laser system integration. Until the next time, this was Optica here for you to help you with our photonic knowledge. And the next time, see you. And I think our next meeting is next week, Tuesday, 10 a.m. Washington time, hyperspectral imaging systems. Until then, this was Optica for you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.